Our next talk uh, will be given uh, by two esteemed Filipino amateur astronomers and my two dear friends. Aside from being the initiators and founders of the Philippine National Astronomy Week celebration, as mentioned earlier by James, our two speakers are also the first two Filipinos who had an asteroid named after them. In 1995, the International Astronomical Union named asteroid 6282 Edwelda in their honor. Edwin Aguirre and Imelda Joson started in the Philippine Astronomical Society, or otherwise known as PAS, where they were very active members, then officers. Even after they migrated to the United States, they have established firm connections to and are still dedicated to the advancement and growth of science, especially in the field of astronomy in the Philippines. They will talk about their journey and experiences in the hopes that they will inspire others to jump across limitations and as they say, reach for the stars. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Edwin Aguirre and Imelda Joseph. Thank you so much, Jet, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Yeah, yeah. Good morning to everybody there in the Philippines. Um, and do you want to start? Yeah, we'll the, uh, uh, get started. Let me just share our screen. Okay. Oh, you need to do PowerPoint first, I think. Nope. Okay, let's share. Slides start from the beginning. Yeah. Oh, I think. Uh, how do you do this, Jet? Because uh, yeah, the, the the full screen is not showing. Huh? We Your can mute? see your full screen. We can see. Oh, you can screen. see the full screen. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, yeah, the, okay. the the thing ours is, is blocked by the uh, the panelists, so you can oh, see the whole the whole frame. Yeah, that, that oh, I can probably. see it. Uh, you can adjust your, but uh, of course, if it does, it's not a bother with you so much with the presentation. Yeah. Uh, you can just keep we'll, on advancing. Yeah. Yeah, we'll uh, do a different gallery view. Where's the gallery view? Just choose a speaker view. Yeah. Can't see the button. Uh, oh, maybe it's down there. Uh, Is that the one? Not sure. Nope. I can't see the gallery uh, button. Anyway, go ahead. Okay. We are brought into this world through the love and commitment of two very special people our parents. They provide us with affection, guidance, care, and protection, and they endure so many personal sacrifices in order to give us the best they could in terms of health and nutrition, a happy home to grow, good education, to achieve our full potential, and so much more. Ultimately, we become a reflection of our parents, not just in the continuation of their genetic lineage, but also in the perpetuation of their sense of family values, traditions, dreams, and aspirations. There comes a time in life, though, when we seek to become independent from our parents, a time to make our own choices and decide on the path we would like to take. This is when our lives become our own journey of survival, a journey filled with ups and downs, challenges and successes, lessons learned, and lessons taught. Before long, we too would, be, would get married and become parents, and the cycle continues. This is our life on earth. For both Edwin and I, our childhood curiosity and sense of imagination have taken us on a lifelong journey of exploration and discovery. In our study of both the microscopic and macroscopic realms of the natural world, we have come to observe and understand that there are only two things certain in this world, birth and death. Everything born ultimately has to die, from viruses and bacteria, the blue wave 
the largest known animal ever to have existed on planet Earth. This also includes the countless stars that populate our visible universe. It is therefore important for us to understand that our physical existence on this planet is very much limited. How we'd like to use that time between birth and death and how we'd like us to be remembered is very much up to us. Let's hope that the examples and lessons our parents have taught us and the knowledge we've amassed from years of education in school and the lessons we've learned throughout our everyday lives would guide us in making the right choices in order to create a positive contribution to society, to humanity, and to our planet and all that live in it. I still clear clearly remember when as a child, my fascination for the night sky started. One evening, I found my mom and her siblings looking out the window facing the western sky. I asked what they were doing, to which my mom replied, they were looking for a comet. When I asked what a comet is, she looked at me with a brief pause, then said, it's a witch riding a broom. In my mind, I had this image of a Disney character of a witch riding a broom. I knew I needed to see this. I stayed way past my bedtime, even skipping dinner, keeping an eye in the sky as the intense orange glow started to disappear and it got darker and darker. That witch must have zoomed through the sky without me seeing it. But when I saw the points of lights with varying sizes and colors and twinkling like diamonds in the veil of the night. It was magical. As the hours went by, they appeared to move through the firmament. I couldn't wait to flip the pages of my encyclopedia to read about that witch on a flying broom, or rather, that comet. Of course, I couldn't understand much of what I read back then. I was only five. I was, but that night I discovered that there is a whole different world beyond where my feet stands. I didn't stop until I understood what comets are. And years later, even wrote a book about comets. Finally, I told my mom that it may have taken me years to understand what the witch riding a broom is all about, that the broom represents the comet's tail. Back then, there was no internet, no Google, no Siri or Alexa. We only had books and encyclopedias, binoculars and telescopes. But most importantly, we have our curiosity, our passion to learn and understand. Answers didn't come quickly as they do now. But in our search for truth and knowledge, we began one of the most enjoyable and intellectually fulfilling journey of our lives. Now we understand that those points of lights are actually stars or other suns shining through the process of thermonuclear fusion. That the light reaching our eyes at any one given moment have traveled at the speed of 186,282 miles per second over great distances. Some took only years to reach us, but others may have taken hundreds of thousands, even millions of years. That is why when we look up at the night sky, we actually see back in time. As we look at our own sun, we are actually looking back eight minutes ago. When we look at Alpha Centauri, the next closest star to us aside from our sun, we are seeing the light from almost five years ago. When we look at the Andromeda galaxy, we are seeing the light from approximately 2 million years ago when there were still no modern human roaming the earth. Our knowledge of this universe is based on what our instruments can detect and what our minds can comprehend. As science and technology progresses, 
so does our understanding of this cosmos. Join us as we take a quick journey, ex terra ad astra et retro, from the earth to the stars and back. This is our personal motto. We live on a very unique planet that is approximately four and a half billion years in age in a solar system that is located in the Orion arm of a barred spiral galaxy we call the Milky Way. Our species is only one of about 8.7 million species that call Earth as home. Although it was just in the past 2 million years that the human species emerged on Earth, it wasn't until just about 300,000 years ago that Homo sapiens sapiens, or modern man, appeared. But in the past 300,000 years, we have made significant progress from, <clears throat> my apologies, from, hunt, from being hunter-gatherers to builders and explorers of worlds even beyond Earth. Living in a non-light polluted world, early modern men was, were so fascinated with those points of lights they saw marching in the night sky. <clears throat> the ancient Arab and Chinese astrologers began mapping them and naming patterns, thus the birth of constellations and celestial cartography. In 1609, Galileo Galilei used his telescope and had a closer view of objects in the heavens. But the science of astronomy continued to evolve with bigger and better telescopes, more accurate calculations, and the birth of astronomical photography, which expanded our understanding of the night sky. From a rudimentary telescope with which Galileo made drawings of the surface of the moon, the giant telescopes at Mount Wilson, Palomar, Mount Akia, the Sila, to the Hubble Space Telescope, and now the James Webb Space Telescope, humanity continues to see deeper into space and in time. It wasn't until the 1960s, or just about, sorry, excuse me, can I get something? My apologies for this. I'm having dry throat right now. It wasn't until the 1960s or just about 60 years ago when a new chapter in astronomical exploration began. When human ingenuity and the marvels of engineering allowed us to send astronauts to the moon and even collect samples and send unmanned probes to explore other planets, moons, asteroids, and comets. We have even sent probes to study the atmospheres of distant worlds and landed robotic rovers and spacecrafts equipped with science labs to study the compositions of rocks and also try to find any microbial life form on the surface of Mars. We have come a long way from when early explorers journeyed to uncharted territories to find new land on Earth, to modern robotic explorers giving us a better understanding of our own solar system. The dedication and work of many scientists have expanded our knowledge of what is even beyond our solar system, to the realm of nebulae and galaxies. We have come to understand that nebulae, <laughs> my apologies, Edwin is so slow in pushing the button here. We have come to, we have come to understand where am I? The dedication of, and work of many scientists have expanded our knowledge of what is even beyond our solar system. To the realm of nebulae and galaxies, we have come to understand that nebulae are either stellar nurseries or remnants of dying stars. They are giant clouds of dust and gas floating in interstellar space. Most nebulae and galaxies are observed, we observe today have been painstakingly cataloged and mapped. And beyond our own 
Milky Way galaxy, populating the vast universe are millions and millions of other galaxies that are made up of billions and billions of stars and solar systems. It just makes us wonder how vast the universe truly is. Now we ask not what those points of lights are up in the night sky, for we have now unraveled the secrets of stars, their birth, their sources of energy, and even how they die. We now know that our universe is approximately 13.8 billion years old, and that our own Milky Way galaxy is about 13.6 billion years in age. But rather, we now ask about gravitational lensing and gra gravitational waves, gamma ray bursts, quasars and pulsars, black holes, dark matter, and dark energy. Do we really live in a universe or a multiverse? Scientists are now exploring planetary systems in other stars. The more questions we answer, the more questions we ask. For humans are by nature never contented. For without that desire, that driving force to learn more, humanity would have accomplished nothing. But what is most important is that in our study of the vastness of space, and the infinity of time, that we realize how insignificant we are in the totality of creation. And amidst the cosmic proportions and harmony of the universe, we are brought to humility. From humility, we find wisdom. And from wisdom, we learn survival. We have devoted decades of our lives exploring and trying to understand the worlds beyond our planet but only to find ourselves even more fascinated with our own planet Earth and all that live in it. The only planet we know of that has the perfect conditions for harboring life. Earth is teeming with life. From the depths of the oceans and caverns to every corner of every continent on this planet, there is life each with its own purpose, its own reason for being here. The complexity of life on Earth and the symbiotic relationship of each one is truly awesome and humbling to see. Our planet is about 4.5 billion years old. It took a billion years for Earth's condition to be ripe for early life form. But in that four in a half billion year history for our planet, there have been five major mass extinction events. The Ordovician Silurian extinction some 440 million years ago, the Devonian extinction some 365 million years ago, the Permian Triassic ex event some 250 million years ago, the Triassic Jurassic some 210 million years ago, the Cretaceous tertiary 65 million years ago. Through fossil records, we now know that prokaryotes like cyanobacteria became the dominant life form for 2 billion years. They were responsible for fixing the carbon dioxide in the water and was responsible for, produce, for producing oxygen through photosynthesis. During the Cambrian period, During the Cambrian period, about 521 million years ago, trilobites appeared on Earth. They're one of the most successful life forms on early Earth, having survived for about 270 million years, after which they became extinct during the Permian extinction event some 252 million years ago. It wasn't until 1796 that humans began to understand that life forms on Earth can go extinct. Climate change is sadly real and a natural process. Of but right now, we humans, our behavior is acceptable. Many scientists believe that we are now on the sixth extinction event. And it is because of humans. Only the tardigrades or water bear, a microscopic life form, survived all five extinction events. 
Will it survive the sixth? Will we humans survive the Holocene extinction? Modern man, Homo sapiens sapiens, that is us, our species, have only been around for some 300,000 years. Yet in that short time span, we have achieved so much. From using crude tools to growing our own food supply, to inventing language, writing, music, art, to sending man to the moon, to inventing the internet, to sending rovers to Mars, to creating human-like robots. Humanity is capable of doing so much good, but it is also capable of destroying its own species and taking along with it many other species. Our planet is resilient. It will survive. But what may not survive are the beautiful and innocent inhabitants of Earth, those that are just doing what they're here for. The root cause of many of our earthly problems is the overpopulation of the human species. Because of it, we need to grow more food to sustain our ever-growing population. So we result in overfishing our oceans using synthetic fertilizers and pesticides in our farming method, which then destroys the soil's ecosystem, resulting ultimately in soil loss. Society have also placed too much emphasis in consumerism, that we over harvest our natural resources or worse develop products that are harmful and destructive to our planet, to ourselves, and to many other life forms that call Earth as home. Consumerism is what causes our factories to produce greenhouse gases, contributing to the acceleration of climate change. We also produce so much waste because of this addiction to consumerism, some of which won't biodegrade in our lifetime. Some even contaminate our oceans and end up in the fish we eat, PFOA and PFAS, the forever chemicals, are now on most of the water we drink. Animals go extinct in our lifetime because of overhunting and trophy hunting. They also go extinct because of the pesticides we use on a daily basis. In the 1950s, peregrine falcons, one of the most majestic birds around, the fastest animal on the planet, were lost east of the Mississippi and the population took a dive throughout the world due to the use of the chemical dichlorodiphenyltrichloroethane, or popularly known as DDT. DDT was used to kill insects, which were the food for the songbirds, which in turn are the food for the predatory birds. DDT then went up the food chain. Conservationists and the government added the bird to the endangered species list and gave it protection, banned the use of DDT, and went to work to reintroduce the birds to areas where they were lost. Here in Massachusetts, we became a part of this effort for about 16 years now. We helped Dr. Tom French of the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, the biologists responsible for bringing back the population of peregrine falcons in our state. We monitored the pair daily and rescued their young during nesting season. It is one of the few success stories of conservation efforts here. But we don't only save these birds because they're beautiful, but because they, they're needed to balance the ecosystem. They are the natural control for smaller birds. While helping them, we've learned so much from them too. Watching their behavior gave us a better understanding and appreciation of our very own lives. We've been privy to their everyday lives for the past 16 years. They may not have soft and comfortable beds, but just pebbles in their nest. They may not have signature clothing, just the feathers on the back of the, to protect them from the elements. They may not have Rolex watches to tell them the time, but they know based on the position of the sun. They may not have books or televisions or video games, just the natural world to watch and to entertain them. 
They live a stressful life each day. They have to be on constant guard to protect their territory. They have to endure the extreme changes in the weather each day and as the season changes and as climate change gets worse, they have to adapt. They won't be able to have a meal if they don't catch prey at least twice a day, but they go on. They take care of their needs, uh, the needs of their young. They mate for life. They teach their chicks how to fly, how to hunt, and they lead by example until their young are ready to be on their own and find their respective territories. And here we are humans complaining of being stressed each day. Some of our pollinators are also at risk of going extinct because of pesticides. If not for them, we won't have agriculture. We won't be able to grow our food without resulting in synthetic methods. Suburban America have turned to having lawns rather than gardens. They plant low maintenance bushes rather than pollinator friendly plants. Their lawns are like golf courses fed with so much synthetic and carcinogenic fertilizers and pesticides. We see that every day in our own neighborhood. They even kill and drive away wildlife because they defecate on their precious grass, not realizing that those poop are organic matter that feed the soil. Yet unlike them, we buy a lot of composted chicken manure to feed our own grass. We use corn gluten as pre-emergent weed control. We mulch mow to return the nutrients of the grass back to the soil. Yes, our lawn looks like a golf course too but done in an organic way. The wildlife th that visits our garden are the ones responsible for controlling whatever pests there are. Possums and wild turkeys peck and eat ticks. Rabbits control the weeds and the bees and butterflies pollinate the organic vegetable garden. Our earthworm rich soil doesn't only feed the small birds that visit, but the worm poop, the vermi compost they produce and reaches our soil even more. It can be done and we've proven it. To help the pollinators, we've this, we've, to help the pollinators, we've decided not only to have a pollinator friendly garden, but to harvest the eggs and hatch monarch butterflies whose population has gone down significantly due to deforestation in their wintering sites. We've added milkweed to our garden where adult monarchs deposit their eggs. We then harvest them and watch as they metamorphose into beautiful monarch butterflies before releasing them back to the wild where the fourth or fifth generation will make the 3,000 mile journey to Mexico. We have a video to play. Yeah, that's a video actually. Sorry about that. This one? Yeah. Oh, I think it didn't do it as a... Oh, oh yeah, there did. you go. Yeah. So we'll just show a video clip. So the fourth and fifth generation will make the 3,000 mile journey to life. Mexico. We love you. Safe journeys, baby. Safe journeys, okay? The baby. That your proboscis and eat. It's a female and it's holding on to me. Okay, baby, you're free. Looking around, baby. Don't be afraid. Okay, I'm gonna let you go, baby. So this one that we release will make the 3,000 mile journey to Mexico, where it will spend the winter months before heading back up north in spring. As we do this, we also use this opportunity to teach the neighborhood kids about science, for mentoring is important. 
Our journey have inspired us and have opened our minds to the true beauty of this world and to the true meaning of success. That success is not just about accumulating material wealth, but rather it is about using our God-given talents for the betterment of all. It is not about selfishness and greed. It is about selflessness, about mentoring, about helping others bring out the best in them. It is not about taking advantage of others for our own agenda, but it is about leaving a good legacy behind. A legacy that will educate and inspire that others may do the same. It made us understand that we are the caretakers of planet Earth, that each one of us have a role and a responsibility to fulfill, a purpose for being on this planet, that we are a part of the symbiosis on Earth, that life doesn't revolve around us, Instead, we are just a tiny part of this planet's ecosystem. We are the authors of our own life story. Each day we live is like a page in our book of life. How colorful and vivid we'd like it to be depends solely on us. I would like to give a, a, to read a quote from Dr. Carl Sagan. In the last few millennia, we have made the most astonishing and unexpected discoveries about the cosmos and our place within it. Discoveries which are exhilarating to consider. They remind us that humans have evolved to wonder, that understanding is a joy, and that knowledge is prerequisite to survival. I believe our future depends on how well we know this cosmos in which we float like a morning dust in the morning sky, a moat of dust in the morning sky, end of quote. Thank you and have a good day, friends. You have to stop screen share first. Oh, oh. yeah, sorry. <laughs> Oh, stop share. Uh, no, 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 yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Imelda. That was a very beautiful and inspiring talk, really. So, uh, thank you. I'm just the slide operator. <laughs> also, great work, Edwin. <laughs> Uh, Had to keep up with her. <laughs> yeah. so, By the way, uh, aside from the space photos, you know, photos uh, taken by Hubble and James Webb Space Telescope, all the photos you saw on our presentation were taken by us. Yeah, so we took yeah. those photos, so especially those uh, photos taken from our backyard garden. Very beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So do we have? uh questions from our i don't see any questions i think that was a very very clear presentation i don't see any questions in our chat box but do we have questions from our co-panelists or remarks i have one <laughs> okay yes uh Peter. yeah I'd like, yeah i'd like to take this opportunity to actually Thank you guys, uh, Edwin and Dada, uh, for the benefit of everyone uh, tuning in. Uh, these two uh, wonderful uh, persons are my mentors while I was <laughs> in my youth years, and uh, they are actually the ones responsible for molding me to where I am now. Uh, they pushed me uh, to be inspired by astronomy, stargazing itself. And uh, until today, hands off to both of them. Uh, my full respect to Edwin and Dada for taking good care of me when I was in my, <laughs> when I was in my youth years uh, trying to learn astronomy. And uh, if it wasn't for them, uh, I wouldn't actually be here today. <laughs> so thank you guys. Thank you very much for being yeah, my mentors. That was, that was 
very touching. Thank you so much. You know, you. Edwin and I do our best in everything, in every, you know, journey we take um, and hoping that we can reach even one and change one person um, and, you know, inspire even one to go into the sciences. And yeah, that's our personal measure of success, making a difference in somebody's life. And thank you, Peter, for that testimonial. That was nice and unexpected. And mm -hmm. we still remember first meeting you uh, during one of the monthly meetings of the Philippine Astronomical Society at the Manila Science High School. Yeah, so yes. thank you. that was a long time ago, but uh, yeah. thank you. Yeah, we appreciate your uh, your words and your, uh, uh, you know. Yeah, we're, if we're going black, our apologies. Uh, yeah. Ed Edwin and I haven't had sleep for a week. <laughs> Yeah. You know, take, we've been yeah. taking care of our, you know, taking turns, taking care of our uh, baby, our cat. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you also, Peter, for the heartwarming uh, sharing. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a question here from uh, the former president of uh, the Philippine Astronomical Society, I think last year. Uh, is that correct, James? Uh, Christian, Christian Di Macali. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hi. The question from Christian uh, is, hi, could you share something about the activities that happened on the first celebration of the National Astronomy Week? Oh, well, that was a long time ago. Maybe how, how, how it came, how it evolved, how, how it came about that you decided to propose National Astronomy Week. Maybe that would be a nice oh, way okay. to, uh, yeah, well, to we, share that. You know, like, as usual, Imelda and I do our brainstorming session uh, try to find ways on uh, promoting astronomy in the Philippines. And during one of those sessions, it was just the two of us, uh, I believe this was late nine, 1980, oh, late 1990, yeah, 1980s. 80s, I think it's uh, yeah, 80s. Late 80s. Yeah, uh, late 80s. that's how the book on Halley's Comet also came about during one of our brainstorming sessions. So, I mean, it's just, it's like last year when we had the National Astronomy Week celebration and you invited us to give a talk and it was my first Zoom talk. And, and then what did I say? Hey, this would be a good opportunity to start a speaker series. So that's what we have uh, ongoing. So it, it's similar to how, how the National Astronomy Week celebration happened. Well, back then, astronomy in the Philippines, um, you know, there was just a few people that you will actually see attending the meeting at the Manila Science High School. And uh, yeah, Dustin. yeah uh, the same people over and over and over. And so when, when Edwin and I got started in astronomy, uh, you know, as kids, people would always say back then, you know, we would, we would be very excited sharing what we saw through the telescope the night before. But, but people were like, I don't want to stay up the whole night. You know, I'm not that kind of person or or I don't want to deal with the mosquitoes at night, you know, with the observatory because they're, you know, being in the Philippines, there's a lot of mosquitoes at night. So that's how we got started with astrophotography. And then we wanted to share our photos. And that's how we got started with writing for the newspapers. For Manila, yeah, Manila Bulletin was the first one. Started our science journalism career. Yeah, Manila Bulletin was the first one who published our photo. And then we started writing articles for Manila Bulletin, The Daily Express, Malaya, uh, Manila Times, Philippine Star, um, and, and, and a few others. And so sometimes it's, it's it just, you know, the need there you see the need that you need to promote something. You need to promote the science. You need to to, to share your passion. And, and that's how it Yeah. Uh, well, going back to the uh, first National Astronomy Week, this was probably late 1989 or early 1990 when we had that brainstorming session. And we said, it's good. You know, it's, it's good that the PAS, the Philippine Astronomical Society at that time, was conducting its own, you know, stargazing sessions, uh, a lot of overnight stargazing at the Manila Observatory in Quezon City. But we said, 
we need to make this national. We need to get the government involved and the other organizations. So we need something that would actually push them to work and cooperate uh, in doing this uh, promotion of astronomy, not just in um, Manila or Metro Manila, but the entire country. So we said, why not you know, get a, an official declaration from uh, our, the Philippine government? So that's, that's when we had the idea of proposing for this. Maybe Initially, we wanted a National Astronomy Day but they said it's better if it's a week. So at least if it the, if the weather doesn't cooperate, you still have other days, you know, to celebrate. And, and I remember Edwin writing the actual proclamation. No, no before the writing, uh, we proposed the idea, and we approached the uh, office of the executive secretary of uh, President Cory Aquino, and the the person said, you know, it would be easier and a lot faster if you just write the proclamation yourself and then the president will just sign it so that's what we did so we went home and i drafted the proclamation and i have to do some research on the legal language of uh, a presidential proclamation how it's done and so i use that as a template and of course i have we melden i have to come up with the various reasons why astronomy needs to be celebrated uh, in the first place. That's why we came up with several uh, reasons in the proclamation. And then we submitted it. And we actually hand delivered Yeah, we, we went to we, Malacanang, hand delivered the letter to the secretary. Yeah, she the, met us at the sitting room. Yeah, the um, music room, I think. To the personal secretary of uh, Cory Aquino and they said they'll get, get in touch with us. And then a few days later, we found out that through the mail, they mailed us a copy of the proclamation. And so Pagasa was able to um, join in the celebration. Yeah, and, Dr. Roman Quintanar was yeah. very, very supportive. Uh, the effort. National Museum Planetarium, yeah. uh, the Pagasa Planetarium in Quezon City. So uh, there was actually a committee that, f that was formed to coordinate all the planning uh, of you know, the activities throughout the week. And what is, I remember now, what is amazing is the president signed the proclamation March 26, and the opening of the National Astronomy Week was April 16. So we only had like two weeks to put together uh, a program. And fortunately, uh, all the other agencies at uh, the Department of Science and Technology, you know, gave their support. And so we had, uh, I think there was conferences at UP. Yeah. UP Diliman. And there were stargazing sessions at the Manila Observatory and free public showing uh, at the uh, National Museum Planetarium in Luneta. And what else? We, yeah, we went out to give lectures also to various schools. Yeah. Um, so throughout the week, it was a very uh, but but active... you have to you have to remember uh, no internet at that time. No, no. <laughs> also, <laughs> no you, social you media. You have to remember that the observatory through Father Badilio, who was very very, very supportive, supportive. Yeah. Yeah. He he opened up the the roof deck of the observatory for people to come and, and yeah, join so every the stargazing night, Every session. clear night, there was a stargazing yeah, and, session. And, and we were so used to it already because of Halley's Comet. Remember, Peter, you were there uh, during Halley's Comet when we had to, to conduct not just our research on, on Halley, but also um, the people who were coming, hundreds of people coming. Yeah, and also we, we gave talks about astronomy at uh, various schools, you yeah. remember. So... And it was we covered. Were back, we were back then very young, so we had all the energy. Yeah, and uh, it was like it got good coverage in the local daily newspapers like Manila Bulletin, Inquirer, Chronicle. Yeah, yeah, others. that's the other Philippine Daily Inquirer. Yeah, so yeah. that's how it got started. And okay, uh, Edwin, yeah. why why February third week of February in particular? Well, that actually was. Uh, 
I decided the, by the 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 officers of the astronomical society because of the weather situation. I think weather is much better during February and and uh, the the kids are still in school yeah and it's oh, not too so, hot not too cold so oh, so that's why it's not it's not April or yeah April or yeah, summer because April yeah. gets too hot oh. and then uh, December there's so much activity so we said probably February would be good that's why the <laughs> second the second national astronomy week which was inaugurated by uh vice president salvador laurel was held on the 3rd february of 1992 uh, this is in 1992 okay thank you yeah uh, so i i will read another comment here or question from you know him i think thomas encarnacion uh, he said would you recommend that while we look up to the stars, that we too need to look at the microscopic life, just yes. for the fun of looking? Yeah. Uh, Tom, it's not just for the fun of looking, but you know, you're going as one of the slides we presented there that you know we look through the microscope, see the microscopic, and see the macroscopic, and you're you're going to see patterns there, and and um, it is so amazing that you know. It, it, we're not just small compared to the universe, but there's stuff that are smaller than us and they have their own world. And, and it's a whole universe of mi microscopic organisms. And it's very fun to explore and study and even just for, for fun. You don't have to uh, be taking up biology or, to microbiology. Enjoy, or microbiology yeah. to enjoy the microscopic life. Agree. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, there's a comment here from Alan, our own Alan Yu. Uh, oh. That's a very big telescope for Australia's private observatory. <laughs> I would be happy to know if such a big instrument has been offered in the Philippines too. Well, Philippine one of yeah, 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 Alan, the the first one on the slide there that you saw the, the white, white one, uh, the white tube. That that was for the Department of Science. Uh, we hmm. were we were asked to. Build that telescope. That's a 17 and a half inch uh, telescope, Newtonian telescope. I think it's f 4.5. And uh, it's, yeah, and there's two of them we made. One is the wooden box. Yeah, that's, that's the one box. that went to Australia. Yeah, it that's was, the one that... We were commissioned by a German anthropologist who was living in the Philippines back then, and he was moving to uh, Australia. He said he has dark skies and he wanted an observatory. So I think he wanted uh, to turn it into a, an educational tool for the residents there. And then uh, Dr. Seferina Foliosko of uh, the Department of Science and Technology found out that we built a telescope and it was sold to uh, a scientist in Germany. So he commissioned us to build a second one, which is the, the one with the white tube. Yeah, so it's the same uh size in terms of primary mirror 17 and a half inches yeah back then that was the biggest telescope in the country mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wow so thank you so I, I guess we have to proceed uh because yes. uh, we have one more speaker <laughs> thank you so much again Velda, Deada, and uh, Edwin and yes, my uh, pleasure. I would like to take this opportunity to give you our own certificate of appreciation and this certificate is presented to Imelda Joson and Edwin Aguirre for their invaluable insights, experiences, and expertise shared with the participants for their talk from the Earth to the Stars and back, held as part of the ALP NAW 2023 opening program given this 19th of February of 2023, signed by James Kevin T., President and Vice President of San Francisco Aguilar. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for inviting us.